President, it's been more than a month since Russia launched an unprovoked and unwarranted attack against the people of Ukraine. In the interim, the world has marveled at the strength and the resiliency and the courage of Ukrainian forces, as well as their leadership in President Zelensky. Ukraine has a real shot at defeating this Russian aggression, but that can only happen if it has the weapons and resources it desperately needs. I recently traveled to Poland and Germany with a bipartisan group of Senate colleagues to learn more about what Ukraine needs and the challenges our NATO allies are up against. Over the course of three days, we met with American military leaders and diplomats, as well as members of the 82nd Airborne. We spoke with our NATO partners who are supporting both the military and humanitarian needs of Ukraine. And we had the opportunity to talk to some of the Ukrainian refugees themselves. The primary message we heard, consistent message that we heard, was we need more and we need it faster. More stingers, more javelins, more air defenses, more lethal aid. And they reiterated, the, reiterated their need for aircraft like the Poland MiGs. Statements of support are important, but they do nothing to help the Ukrainian forces defeat this Russian aggression. It was an incredibly powerful and enlightening experience to hear directly from the incredible men and women on the ground. And I want to thank our friend Senator Ernst from Iowa for leading this bipartisan congressional delegation. I think it also sent a very strong message to our friends and allies in the region that 10 senators, one-tenth of the United States Senate were willing to make this trip on a bipartisan basis. I think we all came back with a deeper understanding of Ukraine's needs and a renewed sense of urgency to do everything in our power to make it happen. Over the last four weeks, Russia has bombed Ukrainian hospitals, schools, apartment buildings, humanitarian refugee corridors even, even civilians waiting in a bread line. It's pretty clear that we need to use every tool available to bolster Ukraine's defense and weaken the aggression of the Russian forces. It's not a matter of one or the other. We need to do both. To support Ukraine, we need to answer the call for more defensive weapons. Whether intentionally or not, the administration has given Ukraine the bare minimum, just enough to keep it completely from being completely overrun by the Russians, but not enough to help it win the war. In other words, the Biden administration is propping up Ukraine to, to keep taking further hits rather than giving it the full forces it needs to win the fight. We need to help Ukraine vanquish Russian forces from its territory entirely, not just to extend the length of this war, Actually, by not giving Ukraine everything it needs in order to repulse Russian aggression, we're playing into Putin's hands because Putin has clearly changed his tactics from the initial reports of trying to encircle Kiev, perhaps assassinate President Zelensky and install a puppet government. Clearly, the Ukrainians were, Putin has bitten off more than he can chew when it comes to invading Ukraine and executing on that original mission. But now he's engaged in a war of attrition, flattening Ukrainian cities, killing innocent civilians from outside of Ukrainian airspace because he's worried about the anti-aircraft capabilities of the Ukrainians using things like man pads and javelin missiles and stinger missiles, excuse me. Well, time is on Putin's side, and we need, to, we need to level the playing field and actually give the Ukrainians what they need in order to stop this war as soon as possible before further loss of life and further damage to their country is done. 
Now, the most effective way to do this, since Ukraine's not a member of NATO, we're not going to send troops there, as President Biden has said, appropriately so, but we need to ensure that the Ukrainians have everything they need in order to do the job themselves. As President Zelensky has said, Ukraine can't shoot down Russian missiles with shotguns and machine guns. Unfortunately, there are a lot of roadblocks standing in the way, and unfortunately, one of those is the reluctance of the Biden administration to quickly and expeditiously get the Ukrainians what they need. For example, Poland offered to transfer its entire fleet of MiG-29 fighters to the United States for delivery to Ukraine. Ukrainian forces already know how to fly these Russian aircraft, and President Zelensky assured us that they are desperately needed. But the Biden administration rejected the offer after first Secretary Blinken seemed to give it the green light. The administration changed its mind out of fear that they might provoke Putin, once again playing right into his hand. All Putin has to do is rattle his saber to deter the United States and its allies from helping Ukraine to the maximum of our capability. Another big obstacle that the Ukrainians are finding is the red tape associated with anything that the federal government seems to do. Ukraine's provided a detailed list of the resources it needs. Fighters, anti-aircraft missile systems, more stingers, more javelins. It's not a list of items they'll need next month or the next. It's what they need right now in order to survive. The process of getting defense articles into Ukrainian soldiers' hands includes some big bureaucratic hurdles that not only make it harder to act quickly, but make it more difficult to send Ukraine the resources they desperately need. Fortunately, there's strong precedent from World War II that we could follow to help expedite the process. During World War II, when Britain was hanging on by a thread and the United States was a non-combatant in that worldwide war at the time, President Roosevelt vowed to transform the United States into the arsenal of democracy, as he called it. And he worked with Congress to pass the Lend-Lease Act. This legislation allowed the United States to use its industrial might to supply Britain and our other allies with the resources they needed at a critical time in World War II and without lengthy delays. Borrowing inspiration from President Roosevelt, I introduced bipartisan legislation with colleagues called the Ukraine Democracy Defense Lend-Lease Act, which will expedite getting Ukrainian forces the resources they need to win the fight without any unnecessary delays. I also think that in addition to the actions by the administration, I think it sends a strong bipartisan message of support from this body and gives encouragement to our friends in Ukraine who are fighting for their very existence. This legislation authorizes the president to enter Lend-Lease agreements directly with Ukraine and provide Ukrainian forces with lethal weapons needed to defend their sovereignty. But I think rather than the piecemeal approach being used by the administration, this would open this arsenal of democracy known as the American industrial base to provide Ukraine what it needs and give them the assurance that whether they need it today or tomorrow or they need it replenished next week, it will be there for them as long as they need it. I'm proud to have worked with a number of colleagues on this bipartisan bill, including Senators Cardin, Wicker, Shaheen, and many others. So far, more than 20 senators have co-sponsored this legislation, and I hope we can pass it without any further delay. This is obviously an urgent crisis. Putin thought this was going to be like the Taliban taking Afghanistan after the United States and NATO's withdrawal. He thought he could take Ukraine without firing a bullet. Well, so much for Putin's plans, his arrogance, and his underestimation of the willingness of the Ukrainian people to fight for their own country. But we need to pass this legislation and ensure Ukrainian forces 
that they will have what they need when they need it. As I said, we have a moral obligation, maybe not a treaty obligation under NATO, but I believe we have a moral obligation to support people fighting for their very freedom and their very lives in a democratically run country like Ukraine. The United States and our allies have imposed crippling sanctions on Russian businesses, banks, oligarchs, which has sent the country's economy into a tailspin. But in typical Russian fashion, they plan for some of these sanctions and they've found loopholes in the current sanction regime. It's taken a page out of Venezuela's book by using the purchase and sale of gold to bring in cash with which to run their economy. The Russian Federation is buying gold to offset the devaluation of the ruble, its currency, and then selling that gold in international markets in exchange for high value currency. In short, Russia is laundering money through the gold market and we need to put a stop to it. I, along with other colleagues, introduced the Stop Russian Gold Act that would bring an end to this practice. We talked to Secretary Yellen, and she agreed that this, supplemental, this would be supplemental to what the administration has already done unilaterally. This legislation would apply sanctions to parties who help Russia finance their war by buying or selling this blood gold. That means anyone who buys or transports gold from Russia's central bank would be the target of sanctions. This would be a huge deterrent to anyone considering doing business with Russia and helping them evade sanctions. In short, we need to take every possible step to cut the financing for Putin's war machine. And this is one additional way to do so. Along with the lend lease bill I mentioned a moment ago, I hope we can pass this legislation without further delay. There's more we can do to support Ukraine and hit Russia where it hurts and to raise the costs associated with its unprovoked and unwarranted invasion of Ukraine. But it's past time to continue to rate, ramp up the pressure to the maximum ability that we can. At this juncture, principal leadership and decisive action are absolutely critical. As Leader McConnell put it, President Biden has generally done the right thing, but never soon enough. For example, last year the president ignored the immense pressure to sanction the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. He finally, after resisting, imposed those sanctions last month. As Russian troops mounted on Ukraine's borders late last year, the administration withheld millions of dollars in aid for weeks before finally releasing it. President Biden disregarded bipartisan calls to impose paralyzing sanctions on Russia before the invasion in order to try to deter it. Instead, he waited until after the invasion happened to try to impose costs on Russia. President Biden ignored calls to stop Russian oil imports until it became clear that Congress would pass legislation to do just that. Once the handwriting was on the wall, the president announced an import ban to try to get ahead of congressional action. President Biden has been so preoccupied with how Putin might react that Putin has been deterring the administration from acting with the sort of expediency and dispatch that are absolutely necessary and called for. Waiting until the court of public opinion is not the kind of leadership that this emergency requires. Mr. President, Ukraine is being bludgeoned by Russia every day. We need to act with all deliberate speed to get them the additional resources they need which means we need to do it now so they can fight and ultimately prevail. The United States may be an ocean away from this conflict, but democracy itself is on the front lines. We know President Putin is motivated by a vision of restoration of the Russian Empire after having called the fall of the Soviet Union 
one of the greatest geopolitical tragedies in history. So we don't know when Putin will stop or if he will stop, which gives us the op only option of doing everything we can to assist our Ukrainian friends from stopping him themselves. We stand in solidarity with our partners in Europe, and we're committed to supporting Ukraine as it defends its sovereignty. So in the coming days, hopefully in the coming hours, I hope the Senate will take action on these bipartisan bills and impose greater costs on Russia in the interests of peace and Ukrainian sovereignty.